Good afternoon. I'm Reed Kramer. I direct the Asset Building Program uh, here at New America. And I'd like to welcome you here to today's event titled, In the Shadow of Economic Fragility, Work and Life After the Great Recession. And the event takes its title from uh, the excellent book, which some of you might have walked by that's for sale outside that you might uh, check out if you're interested. Um, and its title is Working and Living in the Shadow of Economic Fragility. And it's edited by two of our panelists today, Marion Crane and Michael Sheradden, who have collaborated with others at Washington University in St. Louis um, in a very interesting interdisciplinary effort called the Livable Lives uh, Initiative. And today they're going to tell us about this uh, effort. Um, and our other panelists just came in from a meeting at the White House. This is Heather Boucher. And I was saying to her colleague, Pedro, that it's always great to say, I've just come from a meeting at the White House. Um, but uh, really, we've just gotten started, so uh, welcome. But anyway, uh, Marion and, and Michael are going to tell us about uh, their effort, Livable Lives Initiative, which is really designed to move some interests beyond concerns about basic consumption, which is the traditional orientation of welfare policy. Uh, and towards a focus on some of the positive conditions that are essential for promoting economic security, social development, and political uh, engagement. Uh, in, a, in a prosperous society, I think we need to aspire to do more than just meet basic needs. It's, it's a pretty low bar to clear, but we need to focus on doing it well. Uh, but we should also be asking whether or not we're enabling our citizens to reach their full potential to contribute and to achieve their own aspirations. And Marion and Michael's project is designed to, to explore this. Um, at Washington University, Marion has a couple of titles. She's vice provost, she's Wiley B. Rutledge Professor of Law in the law school there, and she's also director of the Center for Interdisciplinary Study of Work and Social Capital. Uh, Michael has a couple of titles as well that I'm aware of, maybe more. Uh, the Youngblood Professor at the George Warren Brown School of Social Work, and he's also the founder and director of the Center for Social Development, uh, a gr great group that we collaborate with um, uh, on a number of projects. Um, to me, he's been a real inspiration, a, a mentor, a friend, um, and a colleague. Um, his 1991 book entitled Assets in the Poor really provided the theoretical foundations for exploring the role that savings and assets can play in social development over the life course. And in 2012, New America organized a symposium that was designed to explore the impact uh, of his thinking over the subsequent couple of years, two decades, Michael, more than two decades, uh, and really um, uh, look at, at the impact it's had on some of the, the policy uh, thinking. And uh, we actually created our own edited volume through that uh, symposium, which there's a handout uh, outside that you can check out as well. So anyway, they're going to tell us about uh, this effort. And then we have a couple of discussants. Michael Lind, my colleague here at New America, uh, he's one of our leading uh, public intellectuals, as well as uh, uh, the policy director for our economic growth program. He contributed a chapter to the book entitled The Challenge of Creating Good Jobs. And we're very pleased to also have Heather Boucher with us, um, whose work I followed for a number of years. And she's now executive director and chief economist at the newly launched Washington Center for Equitable Growth, uh, and also a senior fellow at Center for American uh, Prospect. Uh, so anyway, I, I, I've enjoyed uh, the book. I'm looking forward to hearing more about it, um, uh, the broader initiative, and looking forward to this discussion today. It has four basic broad policy themes that it touches on that I'm, I'm going to just share with you as a way of framing the, the conversation. Uh, the first policy area is really exploring the nature of work and employment and how it connects to economic well-being and uh, democratic engagement. Uh, the second uh, theme is exploring the long-term consequences of the current crisis and really the, the economics of inequality and instability, which are very much still in focus uh, in today's uh, uh, discussion. Uh, a third theme is looking at the values that uh, drive the policy considerations that are teed up and eventually codified in, in legislation. And the fourth is how all these policies fit together to 
affect livable lives among the middle class and among the poor striving to move up uh, the economic ladder. And th these are issues that we focus a great deal on here in the Asset Building Program. Uh, our work examines the impact of how savings and assets can help people save and, uh, you know, well, just how that can work out for those on the lower end and, and the importance of it, ensuring that uh, families have resources to draw upon when they're hit with unexpected events, a job loss, a health event, uh, and how that can provide a, a cushion and also seed investments that can pay off uh, down, the long, down the long run. Uh, even small amounts can make a, a big difference uh, over time. Um, so a lot of uh, interesting things to explore here. And uh, with that, I think we're going to go down the, the aisle here. Uh, I guess Michael's going to go first, uh, Marion, <coughs> then Michael Lind and, and Heather. So thanks for your remarks, and then we'll, we'll include the rest of you uh, as well. Thank you. Michael. Thank you, Reed. Um, appreciate that uh, excellent introduction. Uh, is some working? Um, I was, this let me say, I've, I've enjoyed very much working on this project, the Livable Lives Project. It's been, as Reed said, a truly interdisciplinary project on our campus and beyond. Um, and I direct a, a center, and Marion has directed a center in the law school that cooperated. Uh, we were, I guess, the chief partners, but there were several other academic centers on campus in, in economics and uh, American cultural studies and other areas, and the provost office that all that all pitched in to make this uh, project possible. So um, we we've, we've enjoyed that process. I'm I'm very pleased with the book that has resulted from this. Uh, as Reed said, Michael Lynn has a concluding chapter in the book that, uh, as, as Michael always does, thinks very big about the policy issues and, uh, and makes uh, sense of, the, of uh, all of the preceding body of work. Um, I, I would, uh, my contribution to the volume, other than serving as editor, uh, was minimal, um, but I, I would like to, to make a comment about it. Uh, we, we invited Christina Romer to give, the, to give a, a talk on campus uh, soon after she stepped down from uh, President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors. Um, and Christina came and, uh, and gave a speech about em uh, employment policy. Uh, which which is which starts off the book actually and then and and four of us responded Marion and uh, Steve Fazari in the economics department who also has a chapter in the book with with Barry Cinnamon uh, and Bill Emmons from uh, the Federal Reserve Bank in, in St. Louis uh, really excellent uh, empirical economist and uh, and myself and my my comments were uh, to Christina's talk were. Um, based on um, work earlier in my life and I, uh, and I want to I want to make a particular point about this because it's it stands in in uh, sharp contrast to the policy response um, of, of the last of the last uh, six years I guess since the, since the recession started so I, I had done a dissertation on the civilian conservation Corps of the of the 1930s um, and I think I think it's worth uh, I think there's a fan out here of the CCC. I spent actually spent a couple of years in the National Archives. It was empirical social science, so I was sampling, you know, all kinds of records and recording. So in some ways, I feel like I really was in the Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, and so I, I'd like to I'd like to contrast the response because I think, uh, and I raise I raise a point in, in my my. Uh, small small contribution to the book ab about having an active employment policy and this really this really has not happened in the uh, in the current period so in the recession as you know uh, President Roosevelt uh, created the Civilian Conservation Corps and the Works Progress Administration and other other initiatives to to directly employ uh, uh, lots of people so there there are lots of ways to do active employment policy this is probably the most uh, the most uh, government oriented what just the government just hire people to do to do work uh, we may not want to do something exactly like that in our era but we didn't even we didn't consider hardly any variation of that strategy the the, the primary emphasis on um, demand, such as it was, the primary emphasis on, on stimulating overall demand and that would then uh, stimulate growth and, and uh, employment 
uh, which uh, I'll, I'll leave to others to, to assess the effectiveness of. We've been struggling with, with low, uh, uh, low uh, employment response uh, since the recession and still, still struggling with, with fairly high unemployment. But I, wanna, I just want to make a comment about the scope of what happened in the, in the 1930s. Um, the Civilian Conservation Corps had about, about 300, averaged about 300,000 uh, young men. Uh, there was also a National Youth Administration, uh, not, not everyone is aware of, a, a, different, a different organization also, uh, also employed young women. Um, but the CCC was, was oriented toward males. Um, and, but, and, and, and the labor market today is about three times as large as it was at that period of time. So this would be, if we did something like that on this scale today, it would be, it would be uh, one million young adults uh, employed just in the Civilian Conservation Corps. If, if we did something on, the, uh, on a comparable scope to the Works Progress Administration, we, it would employ uh, at least nine million uh, uh, adults. Um, in today's labor market, if it was a comparable scope, I'm just trying to give you an understanding of the scope of this because nine million, nine million would uh, eliminate the unemployment uh, problem in in the United States. I mean, not just not just help would eliminate it. Uh, so, so these are these are massive. Uh, uh, responses during a very during a very severe economic downturn, the Great Depression, to be sure, uh, they didn't happen right away. As you know, the depression depression uh, got underway in 1929. Roosevelt uh, didn't take office till 1933, so there was real four years of extreme hardship before these policies start to be created. But um, but the the that the country eventually came round to the idea that uh, that uh, that employing people was a was should be a high priority, and I think what's been frustrating for 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 many people uh, in the, in the current political environment is that there doesn't seem to be a consensus and sometimes not even much discussion about about the effects of the. Of the of the recession on employment and and uh, and on people's real real people's lives because of that, uh, it's becomes it becomes a discussion more now by people recognize it as a really excellent chapter by Barry Cinnamon and Steve Fazari uh, in this book, recognizing that if we leave enough people unemployed long enough, it's going to it's going to drag down the whole economy. And this this empirical work and, and this paper in here was the beginning of, of and the paper has gone through an iteration or two since that time and is and has been engaged in a in a broad national discussion. Um, if we, if we, so, so we're getting at the issue of well, maybe we should think about uh, about employment and people and and stabilizing households so that households can can actually be part of an economy so we can all prosper together. This, but 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 we hadn't well, we haven't thought about this. I mean, we think about it in this sort of larger macroeconomic sense right now, and really not so much in the in the in the micro sense of what's happening to real people in. In, in the economy, I'm very, I'm quite, I still remain quite concerned about about conditions. Um, as unemployment remains high. Unemployment among young people remains especially high, and especially among young people of color. Uh, there are there's a, 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 a very high level of, of young African Americans who are not employed and not in school. Uh, and you know, to be honest, I'm not quite sure what the country could be thinking uh, if if young people if if millions of young people are going to be left in these conditions. It's not going to be it's not very promising for a long term future. But we have been locking them up in large numbers. Uh, if we we stop locking them up, uh, as which we can no longer afford to do, states uh, we we we're going to have to deal with the fact that we have lots of people in society who are not. Who are not well engaged, and this is not just a humanitarian issue. It's not a social justice issue. It's a, it's really a it, it is those issues, of course. But it's it's an issue of how does a country function? If we cannot raise our young people so they can become uh, engaged in society and productive adults, we have a we have a real problem. And as far as I can tell, that's kind of where we're headed. So with th with those to, uh, not so positive remarks, I'll turn it over to uh, next speaker, Marion Crane. 
Thanks, Michael. I want to say, uh, first of all, thank you very much, Reed and the New America Foundation, for having us here. This is a great opportunity for scholars who normally talk to one another to talk to the world and the public and policymakers. So we're really grateful for that. Uh, and, and the other thing I want to say is, in addition to a wonderful group of authors and contributors uh, in this book, working with Michael, as far as I'm concerned, is a dream come true. I came to watch you from UNC, where I had worked with former uh, then-Senator John Edwards. Uh, in, a, in a good uh, endeavor called the, Policy, the Poverty Center. I met Michael there. Uh, and it's actually Michael's presence at Washington University that drew me. He's, he's um, a very, despite his, or perhaps this goes along with his, um, his uh, you know, very, he tends to downplay his own, um, the power of his ideas, but he is a uh, in, very influential thinker, and I'm grateful to be associated with him. So I want to talk a little bit about the book's premise and then give you some concrete examples uh, in, from one chapter, drawn from a chapter that I co-authored with an, uh, another, a former student, actually, named Ken Matheny. The book's premise is that economic fragility, by which we mean, among other things, rising income inequality, uh, wealth disparities, and the shift of risk uh, to workers, to individuals, and to, the, to their families. The book's premise is that economic fragility is a consequence of deliberate policy choices. And the policy choice I want to focus on for the purpose of this conversation uh, is the diminished power and influence of labor unionism. So I'm going to start by saying just a few words about what that diminished power and influence looks like in terms of facts and figures. Um, what it was that unions did that was valuable, why we should care, basically, uh, and then conclude with uh, some remarks about why we think this was a deliberate policy consequence, a consequence of policy choices, rather than due to, say, external larger macroeconomic forces or the choices of individual workers, and then gesture at some possible, possible uh, resolutions. So in the 1930s to the 1950s or so, American labor unions were in their heyday. They had a period of dramatic growth spurred on by enactment of the Wagner Act of 1935, the original uh, piece of legislation that compromised, that comprised what we now call the labor laws, the National Labor Relations Act. It was part of the New Deal legislation uh, that was designed to shore up workers' purchasing power and stimulate consumption to pull us out of uh, the Great Depression. The Wagner Act, in a nutshell, protected the right to organize against employer power in the private sector uh, and also gave unions the right to bargain collectively, imposed on employers an obligation to bargain collectively with their employees once they formed unions, and finally protected some tools for workers so that they had some leverage at the bargaining table, the right to strike, the right to picket, to engage in boycotts, including what are called secondary boycotts, where unions pull in workers and employers who deal with the original employer with whom they have a dispute so that the uh, dispute has uh, ripple effects throughout the economy. By the 1950s, unions represented approximately one-third of the eligible population, those covered by the labor laws. Uh, that was their kind of high point. But since the 1930s, we've seen a steady decline, especially uh, after the 1950s and into the 1970s and 80s, in union density and also union power and influence. Today, unions represent only 11% of workers, 6% in the private sector, and roughly 35% in the public sector, with those numbers predicted to go down and steadily dropping. So why should we care? Some at this point might say, well, it's not a bad thing. Unions haven't been all good. Lots of things that they have done have had uh, negative impacts. So let me give you a few reasons why we should care, why it matters even today. First, obvious and most obviously, unions confer a direct wage and benefit effect on the workers they do represent. So as most of you probably know, unions significantly increase wages for the workers they represent. There's an approximate $3.50 wage premium for a unionized worker. It's more for people of color and for women. So they do even more for people of color and women than they do for white men. In addition, unionized workers enjoy substantially better benefits. And this, is prob this is significantly uh, more important at this point. Health, disability, and life insurance benefits, paid leave, and pension plans. 
uh, can be um, kind of summarized in this, in this data. Over $7 an hour differential in terms of the value to unionized workers versus non-union workers. So adding those together, it's a $10.50 plus, depending on your union contract, benefit to workers. Okay, that's the direct effect. But there are significant indirect effects that unions had on the rest of the working class and the middle class, for that matter. These are the spillover effects. First, they established powerful norms through collective bargaining agreements that influenced both the evolution of the law and the kinds of norms and benefits that employers who were not unionized provided to their workforce, including job security protections, the right to be discharged for cause as opposed to at the employer's will, progressive disciplinary systems, the right to have notice and warning and some sort of due process in the workplace before one was disciplined or discharged, seniority systems, apprenticeship training programs, and internal job ladders so that people moved ahead within the company and received training from that company rather than having to job hop as is our more modern uh, kind of um, norm. The threat effect of unions then motivated non-union employers to provide these benefits and more to the non-union workforce so as to decrease the incentive to unionize. Third, unions performed and continue to perform an important function as a watchdog for employee rights that are conferred by other statutes. So there's a host now of individual employment statutes, including uh, occupational safety and health statutes, wage and hour laws, anti-discrimination statutes, um, Family Medical Leave Act protections to protect uh, those who have to take leave to care for themselves or um, family members who are ill. And unions not only educate employees about those statutes and their rights under those statutes, which are not uh, which is not a simple thing, but in addition, they often represent workers, even those, they, they even advocate for those they don't represent by filing amicus briefs in important Supreme Court decisions and fighting against judicial constructions of those statutes that might narrow those rights, those hard-won rights. In fact, unions were the ones who were the main political voice in obtaining those protections in the first place. Unions were key players in uh, obtaining, for example, not only all the statutes I mentioned before, but unemployment insurance, Social Security, Medicare, and uh, the great civil society of the Johnson era poverty, anti-poverty legislation. So unions function as a political voice, a lobbying force for workers, and also historically have uh, worked against the narrowing of those rights once won in the legislature, in the courts um, as well. So um, unsurprisingly then, given the functions that I've just outlined that unions have performed, multiple studies now show a strong correlation and even in some studies a causal relationship, very difficult to establish, between declining union density and influence and growth in wage inequality and also the, an increase in the percentage of corporate profits that are kept by employers and business as opposed to distributed to workers. The erosion of rank and file bargaining power, as we would say in the labor context in the workplace, essentially is responsible for this. It allows employers to reduce wages and benefits and to shift risks to workers uh, so that the employer is no longer the kind of guarantor of the employee's economic future. In the legal and political realm, union loss of influence has translated into uh, losses in the political sphere, some of these are going to be very familiar to most of us, the election of legislators and appointment of judges hostile to workers' rights agendas has meant, for example, big losses for workers in the Supreme Court. Uh, the Dukes against Walmart case is one that comes to mind in the employment arena. This is a case involving a class action sexual sec sex discrimination suit against Walmart in which the Supreme Court made it very difficult for workers to sue as a group. So it's not just labor unionism that now is being cabined, but group rights more generally, including group rights to advance individual employment protections under these other statutes. 
That matters because it's very difficult for individual employees to find lawyers willing to take their cases, particularly low-wage workers. There's not enough at stake. It's just not worth the lawyer's time. So a class action or a collective action is the only way often that uh, lawyers can, will become interested in these cases and bring them to court. Another example of, uh, of a major loss in, that, that is traceable to the loss of union influence and power uh, is the election of governors like Scott Walker and his retrenchment in the Wisconsin context on public sector employee bargaining rights which obviously further contributed to the decline of public sector unionism, and the enactment of right to work statutes, as they are called in a number of industrial stronghold states like Michigan, Indiana, uh, and the like. These right to work statutes essentially create uh, a situation in which unions are even more fragile because they have to deal with free riding employees who don't have to pay union dues. Why is union decline not just a consequence of individual employee choice, you might ask, or larger macroeconomic forces. Why am I arguing that it's a policy decision? And the answer to this question is basically this. Although the labor laws, the Wagner Act of 1935, initially provided a significant boost to unions in organizing workers, the reason we saw this dramatic fall off in union density and continue to see it, or one big reason, is because amendments to the labor laws in 1947 and 1959 and subsequent judicial constructions of the labor laws uh, basically de demolished the protections of the labor law, made what had been a promise to workers into a dangerous illusion. Um, so, for example, uh, the amendments reduced the number of employees covered significantly. Supervisors and managers could no longer organize. It outlawed the secondary boycott, labor's, uh, probably labor's most powerful weapon, Judicial decisions restricted or constricted the right to strike, making it very risky for workers to exercise that right because they could be permanently replaced. My students still ask, what's the difference between being fired and being permanently replaced? There's not much difference, but you can permanently replace someone under our existing statute. Uh, and also limited unions' rights to picket, which was one of the main ways in which the working people uh, got PR across to the public. Uh, certainly in that era. Legislative gridlock at the federal level, with which we're all familiar, and powerful federal preemption doctrines that prevented states from stepping in and trying to do more to protect workers' rights in this context at the behest of unions that might be strong in those states, completed the picture so that the labor laws ultimately became not only ossified, that is, they're not being amended anymore, but obsolete, unsurprisingly. So they no longer fit the needs of a workforce that's increasingly mobile, sh has shorter job tenure, uh, and expands through subcontracting arrangements in complicated ways so we're no longer clear who the employer is, who the employees are organizing against. By the 1980s, union leaders like Lane Kirkland, who was then president of the AFL-CIO, and Rich Trumka, now president of the AFL-CIO, then with the Mine Workers Union, declared that the labor laws were so dangerous and so such a farce that they should be repealed. Both of them argued for a return to warfare in the states. That is, they wanted to be able to fight these battles in courts and in legislatures at the state level. So what should we do now? Clearly, an amendment to this statute is not possible or not politically feasible. So we sketch a couple of prescriptions in the chapter in the book, uh, and I'm happy to take questions about this or refer you to the book since I'm not going to detail this. But they are these. First, if we can't enact legislative reform, at the very least, we should seek to shore up some of the actions that the National Labor Relations Board has taken recently, in the last four or five years, in trying to strengthen worker rights to act collectively, both to bring class actions in court or in arbitration, and to uh, deal with firings that occur as a result of employee conversations that fall far short of a union organizing effort, like Facebook conversations. I'm referring here to what we call the Facebook firing cases. People are fired for talking on Facebook about their supervisors. Um, that's one strategy. 
A second strategy is to repeal the NLRA, which is a provocative move, but one we make in this chapter, and to, to advocate for substitution in its place, a strengthened version of the core part of the NLRA that protects the right to assemble and to act collectively. We would not, in this proposal, advocate for a right to collectively bargain. We would re instead restore the tools to workers to have leverage that they need and let them fight that out with employers. So there are some things about this proposal. I've, I've uh, advanced it in a couple of other contexts that employers actually like uh, so it's this, and, and that lefties hate. Um, so there you go. It's something for everyone to shoot at. In conclusion, our proposal is obviously radical, utopian, or maybe suicidal for organized labor. But we think the NLRA at this point is so anachronistic, such a dinosaur of a statute, so different from other workplace legislation. In terms of its preemption doctrine, it doesn't allow for damage recovery. Employers make a cost-benefit calculus and determine that it's worth violating the law. For those reasons, we think it's more dangerous as an illusion, as an illusion out there that people have rights uh, than it would be if it were repealed and there was pressure for something else to take its place. So dramatic, um, dramatic inequalities require dramatic solutions. I'll stop here. Well, I'm very grateful to have had the opportunity to take part in this project, including the anthology uh, in, in this panel. Uh, and uh, grateful in particular to Michael Sheradden, who's been a, a profound intellectual influence uh, on New America from, from its very origins. Uh, as you can tell from the previous panelists, the whole basis of this uh, project is pushing back on what Robert, Roberto Unger calls false necessity, uh, the idea that there is no alternative. That was a phrase frequently used by Margaret Thatcher uh, to dismiss uh, any other options uh, to her particular set of policies by saying there is no alternative. And the TINA, there is no alternative mantra, tends to dominate discussions of the workforce uh, by saying that there's some irresistible force. Sometimes it's identified as globalization, sometimes it's technology, and there's nothing that can be done. It's beyond the power of human agency. We just have to adapt and, and suffer. Uh, and as uh, Marion and uh, Michael and, and other contributors point out, uh, what is portrayed as the result of irresistible historic forces uh, in many, if not most cases, is actually the result of particular battles, one by one side defeating another in, in particular policy changes. And while the politics may be difficult, it's actually kind of an optimistic analysis because it means that you can, other sides can win other battles and you can have other policies and other statutes, and so on. Uh, in my contribution to the anthology, I don't set forth a particular plan. I just analyze the different options that are available uh, if we want to rebuild the, the livable lives, uh, uh, to use uh, their, their very apt phrase of working class and, and middle class Americans. Uh, in the middle of the 20th century, to, to oversimplify somewhat, uh, the two goals of having a minimum middle class income and minimum middle class benefits uh, were delivered through the job or the good job, uh, which was generally a unionized job. And let's be clear, this was not a utopia. Uh, if you were a unionized white male steel worker with a pension and uh, good wages negotiated by your union, you were, you were uh, pretty well off. It was a very gendered labor market. It was white supremacist, both de jure and, and, and uh, de facto in different parts of the country. And of course, in much of the South and West with uh, right to work states, uh, unions were, were crushed in the cradle and, and uh, were even white male workers didn't benefit from this. But, but it, it is nevertheless true that there were, were these good jobs they came with uh, benefits like uh, pensions where the corporation, the employer assumed the risk, not the individual, uh, and also uh, fairly high wages. And what we've seen in the last generation is the, the jettisoning of the adequate wages from more and more jobs by employers and the jettisoning of benefits by employers and genuine under genuine competitive pressure in some cases uh, uh, not necessarily because they're evil uh, but so sometimes it's it's because of uh, competitive pressure sometimes it's simply because of, of corporate influence in the political system 
But what that means is we've been moving away from this uh, social contract of the mid-20th century in which it was the job or the good job that provided adequate income and adequate benefits towards a new social contract, if you want to call it that, in which one or both of these, the adequate income and the adequate benefits, are provided by someone other than the employer, uh, namely, in some cases, the, the taxpayer. Uh, so this is all very abstract, but, but let me just bring this down to earth. Any s system of wage subsidies, like the earned income tax credit, which has achieved bipartisan uh, support since the 1970s as the major anti-poverty tool, you know, essentially says that we're not going to require employers to pay subsistence wages. We will allow some employers to pay wages that, that people cannot or should not live on, and the taxpayer, through the wage subsidy, will top this up uh, and, and keep these people out of poverty. So, so that means you now have two sources of income. One is your, your wage, and the other is this uh, government subsidy. And one can be in favor of this pro or con. I'm, I'm just pointing out that's a, a innovative model compared to the mid-20th century model. Uh, the same is true of benefits. Uh, as more and more employers, and, and most employers uh, never had generous benefit packages. These tended to be large, concentrated industrial corporations uh, in, in industries like uh, automobiles and steel. Uh, but even there, there's been more and more shifting, as, as the anthology points out, of the risks from the employer to the individual. And we've seen uh, either the, the expansion of uh, uh, subsidized private alternatives, like uh, IRAs, like 401ks, for example. Uh, now, another method would be the expansion of public alternatives, such as Social Security and Medicaid and Medicare, but this has been off the table even for so-called progressive Democrats for the most part, until, at least until fairly recently. Uh, so, you know, that's basically the choices, and I, I think there are kind of two decision points if we think about how are we going to go ahead, uh, if we want to have a new consensus. The first is, do we primarily want to rely on increasing the leverage of workers or increasing redistribution? Uh, increasing the leverage would, would include uh, methods helping uh, unions and collective bargaining of, of the kind that uh, Marion has talked about. And in some cases, it's things like the minimum wage, which increases the bargaining power even of workers who make uh, more than the minimum wage. Uh, so th that's one option. So the workers can bargain for more in the way of income and benefits from their employers. The other option, which to some degree is the path we've been taking, I, I, th I think since the 1970s and 1980s, uh, is using redistribution outside of the employer-employee relationship uh, in order to guarantee some kind of min minimum middle class income, minimum uh, uh, basic benefits. And, that, and there the debate which needn't be the debate between left and right, but, but probably will be, uh, is do you deliver these redistributionist benefits, be they wage subsidies or, or uh, 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 benefits like health care and education, primarily through direct public provision or through some kind of voucher system or some kind of system of subsidies for the private purchase of it? Uh, and, you know, right now we, we've got competing models. So if you look at retirement security, you have Social Security, classic direct public provision. You pay a tax and, you know, you get your check in the mail. Uh, at the same time, there are all of these uh, things that have grown up since the 1970s, IRAs and 401ks, uh, which are essentially taxpayers subsidized. Uh, they're, they're not free market because the, the government is subsidizing these uh, indirectly. But these are tax favor, uh, taxpayer subsidized uh, private savings accounts for retirement. The two major expansions of uh, uh, health care uh, since the year 2000, not counting the expansion of Medicaid under uh, the uh, Affordable Care Act, have taken this pr private route. You know, there was the, the Medicare prescription drug benefit, which is subsidies for private insurance and, and pharmaceuticals. Uh, and uh, the Affordable Care Act uh, it, for n the non-poor who don't qualify for Medicaid where you're subsidizing the private purchase of this uh, merit good, this benefit in a, in a regulated market. So, so those are the options. And, and just to wrap up, uh, my heart is on the side of those who want to increase worker bargaining power. 
but I think with uh, private sector unionism down to, what is it, like 7% of the private sector workforce, and this assault we're seeing on the remaining bastions of, of public sector unionism, I, I just think that merely defending the existing strongholds of organized labor is, is going to be very difficult. Uh, uh, when it comes to whether you want to uh, provide benefits outside, uh, outside of the employer relationship, uh, either through the subsidized private purchase in a market or a quasi-market or direct public provision. I used to be much more sympathetic to the subsidized private purchase uh, than I am now. And it's just, we, we, as time has gone on, we've learned that the, all of these schemes for subsidizing private purchase of health care, of uh, higher education, whether it's student loans, uh, uh, 401ks, they just, they get gamed. And they're going to be gamed by profiteers. Uh, and it doesn't matter how you design it when you set up the legislation because there is so much money involved from raking fees, from private retirement savings accounts, uh, from uh, uh, you know, hidden fees you know, to banks, from student loans, that the lobbyists of these interest groups are just going to just work on Congress session after session, year after year after year. Uh, you know, and uh, it, it's uh, Uwe Reinhardt, uh, a great uh, medical expert, has described our system of private provision of these public goods as uh, feeding the horses in order to feed the birds. I won't go into the <laughs> gruesome details, uh, but it, it does seem to me on a pure efficiency basis the case for simply expanded public uh, provision. Of, of these uh, uh, goods, for example, just simply expanding Social Security rather than coming up with all kinds of elaborate Rube Goldberg schemes of, you know, private uh, uh, tax-favored savings accounts. But on the other hand, rich investors cannot make any money from the expansion of public security. They can make lots of money from, like, you know, investing in all kinds of uh, uh, you know, private savings accounts, at least money, money managers. Uh, and the same is true when it comes to the privatization of higher education and so on. So, but the, the takeaway point is not my preferences, but it's the idea that we actually have enormous flexibility, in theory, how we structure uh, uh, a, a middle class. You know, first of all, you can create a middle class. It doesn't, mean, despite technology and globalization, it was artificial in the past and it's artificial now and you can do it. Uh, other societies, achieve the same goal by different methods. So, uh, you know, T-I-N-A, there is no alternative, is false. Uh, there is an alternative. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so first of all, it's just it's a real treat to be here today. Thank you, Reed, for inviting me, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to comment on this volume. Um, I very much enjoyed um, looking at it. I haven't had a chance to read the whole thing yet because I only got it um, yesterday morning. But um, but I I've, I've gone through most of it, and I think it's um, it's definitely an important contribution. So thank you for for doing this, and um, and of course now I have a bunch of things I want to add to my remarks um, based on what Michael said. Um, uh, so I think this is also going to be a rich conversation we're having here this afternoon. Um, so that uh, so I want to start off by just uh, saying sort of very briefly that the um, that the project that I'm engaged in now at the Center for Equitable Growth, we are trying to understand whether and how inequality affects economic growth and stability. And the themes that are touched on in this volume in the shadow of economic fragility could not be more aligned with the kinds of questions that we are trying to think through. So uh, again, I appreciate being invited, but it's also um, these are issues that we're thinking about a lot. And I'm glad that you framed your remarks. Michael, in terms of uh, Margaret Thatcher's famous, um, there is no alternative, because I think one of the most exciting things that I'm seeing as an economist looking out at what kinds of research is being done, and this certainly fits into this, this bucket of work, growing bucket of work, is that there's a lot of um, new economic research that is pushing back against this idea that there's no alternative, which I think is a new, interesting um, 
uh, development that we, I don't think we had been seeing up until the past, I don't know if I would say a whole decade, but this is certainly a new thing. Um, economists have tended to sort of look at our models and say, you know, we're at equilibrium and everything will just work out fine, thank you very much. Um, but that's not the case. And the idea that policy really does matter, um, I think, is something that's being underscored more and more. And I'll touch back on this again later in, in my brief comments here. Um, but I also wanted to pivot off something that Michael said that I think is so important um, that feeds right into the remarks I wanted to make, which is, um, Michael, you said that there are these two decision points. We I either increase the leverage of workers or we need to redistribute outside the employment relationship. And one of the things that struck me about the book and thinking about um, what it means to be living in the shadow of economic fragility is is sort of, well, what, what do we mean by economic fragility and what's changed? And, um, and connecting the dots between what's happening to us and our families and what's going on in the economy, which so many of these chapters look at that intersection. And of course, one of the most important things that's changed in terms of demographics over the past um, half century or more so now is the movement of women out of the home and into the labor market that peaked. Um, in the late 1990s and has been flatlined since then. So you, this, you saw these enormous changes for families um, that uh, sort of stepped into a labor market built for a different era, an era when you could have workers and wages be the way that you supported a family because typically you had one earner, at least you did in middle class and upper middle class families, to a world where you typically have two earners. And what does it mean to have the decision point be about the leverage of workers in that new family structure? And that's something that's really hard to to figure out. It, it, it slams together different kinds of experts, different kinds of literature, um, you know, folks that, that think on the more sort of labor side and think about unions. We think either about wages or we think maybe expansively about a family wage versus people who are thinking about poverty or issues from, a, from the family experience. These are very, very different. Um, and so this idea that we need to, that the, decision, that the other side is redistribution outside of the employment relationship is in many ways giving up on the kinds of things that Marion was talking about, giving up on 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 um, uh, basically making employers pay for the full uh, cost of their labor force. And that also creates a lot of confusion in terms of who's the bad guy. Um, it was clear, I think, I, I don't know, I wasn't alive 50 or 60 years ago, but I think it was clear who the bad guy was. It was it was the employer in some sense. You, you, there was a clear sort of where that struggle was. Whereas today, I think it's 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 much more diffuse. And if you're, if you're focusing on redistribution, redistribution for whom and what that's going to look like. So a lot of the chapters, and I encourage everyone to pick up the book, focus on different aspects of that. And I wanted to highlight um, a couple of contributions that I thought that I, that I thought for me really got it at some of these issues. And one is um, the piece by um, uh, I'm going to uh, Cinnamon and Fazari. The name Simon. That's right. Am I dead? Okay, now I'm, yeah, Cinnamon and Fazari. I mean, I've been following their work for a while now, and I was really happy to see them in this book. Um, you know, they tell the story, if you aren't familiar with their research, they tell the story um, about how inequality has led to increasing fragility because of the way that it's played out through debt. And this is part of a broad new literature that's been emerging, especially since the economic crisis, although I, for one, would have liked to have seen it, like, I don't know, 10 years before the crisis, so we could have prevented it, but that's another session, perhaps, um, that how inequality Quality uh, played out um, how inequality affected the the lead up to the, the crisis through creating the conditions for greater acquisition of debt. And they have this great chart. And if I was one of those people that did slides, I would show it to you. But they have this great chart where they show um, debt to income ratios across income groups, and they show how the um, the debt to income prior to the crisis grew most for households in the bottom 95%. Um, that it was families sort of not at the very top, but families um, you know, in the bottom 95%, which I think is actually, quite frankly, too big of a group to be looking at, but that they're the ones that were taking on more and more debt, and they were the ones driving consumption. Well, that, of course, is consistent with um, you know, what we would uh, we would we would assume that you know families sort of at the lower end of the income distribution would have a marginal propensity to consume out of income, but the idea that they would also have an increasing marginal propensity to borrow and then spend that money increasingly is this new contribution uh, that Cinnamon and Fazari have brought um, to to the table. Now, um, there's also other research that is focusing on this same, same theme, but in a slightly different way, um, and uh, by Atif Mian and Amir Sufi, who are also arguing, sort of building on the themes of this book, that economic disasters are man-made, that the idea that there is no alternative is wrong, that, and that we have created this, um, this crisis. Um, 
and through through in no small part through policy making, and. I want to just focus on one thing that that, that um, Mian and Sufi talk about that I think is important in relationship to the cinnamon bazaar, which is that they focus on not just how debt led, you know, they, that it was the fall off in consumption that led to the crisis, the consumption had been increased because of debt, but then they go a step back and they say, okay, okay, well, how did we get all this debt? And they, of course, point to the financial deregulation, which is a policy lever that gave us all of the um, the, the access, especially to loans at the, at the bottom end that were no longer uh, government secured in the subprime mortgage market, and that it was because the the effects of the collapse in the housing bubble were felt so unequally across families relative to how much income they had and what their net worth was that that exacerbated um, the crisis in very pointed and important ways, which gets to this theme of fragility that we need to attend to. Um, and so riffing off that, the, you know, the, the thing that, that Mian and Sufi don't ask that I think Michael has alluded to that, that is asked in this book is that, okay, well, so why, why was it that all these families were actually taking on all this debt? What is it about what's been going on in the last few decades in the U.S. economy that changed the conditions for, for families and for households? And here I would go back to um, the fact that, you know, while we saw these massive changes in the U.S. labor market with the increasing labor force participation rates of women, we saw women going into the labor force. We saw families putting in many more hours of work. The typical family puts in 11 more weeks of work per year now than they did a generation or two ago. But what we didn't see was incomes rising. And importantly, what we didn't see was incomes rising in the bottom, I don't know, 80% of the um, income distribution, depending on what years you're measuring it. And that, of course, is a fragility that le has led to families taking on, you know, the part of the conditions that led to this increased debt, um, but also led to a decrease if we, if people had not taken on so much debt, that would have led to a very sharp contraction in economic demand. And so really, I think that one of the things that I was glad to see in here that I, I think is important to really underscore is this connecting the dots between what happens to us in our families and, and how wages and incomes create conditions for, uh, for consumption and demand, um, and then uh, you know at the same time create the, the, um, the capacity for families to invest in the next generation or to create highly productive workers in today's labor market, but that if we without that in not attending to that we've not only created increasing fragility for families but we've actually cr the created the conditions for an increasingly fragile overall economic uh, cycle and that I think is um, uh, therein lies the issue um, to just go back to because um, I because I just I really like the way you frame this Michael within in terms of thinking the leverage of worker uh, focusing on the worker or redistribution figuring out where that answer lies um, is, of course, I think the most urgent issue uh, facing us probably over the next 10 to 20 years, perhaps besides climate change. Um, but understanding, you know, how we're going to deal with what is happening to families in the economy. But I, I think that I would caution us to think of this not just about, uh, to, to not let go of either side of the equation, that this is both about the long-term health and viability of our economy and our economic competitiveness um, in the macro sense, but it is also about the fragility and what's going on in our families at a micro sense. And I think connecting those dots is both good politics, but is also really important for us as researchers uh, to be uh, elevating and, and trying to think through. Thank you. OK, I'm going to pop up here and, and facilitate keeping this um, conversation going. And, and um, yes, a lot of excellent remarks there by uh, Michael and, and Heather. And, and maybe um, we'll start off, Marion, with letting you yeah, respond a bit. Um, you know, I think um, it's a very interesting kind of um, formulation of this trade-off between leverage and um, increasing the redistribution uh, of, of, of resources, and yet there is a context here of the economy, of the nature of work, um, and how uh, it's changed over time. Um, how would you respond to some of that? So I, I too, loved uh, Mike's, Michael's framing of this uh, as the, these alternative policy choices. The first point I would make, though, is that they're not mutually exclusive. They don't need to be. Uh, and I mean, so it's great because it makes it very black and white, and we can easily think about this as a binary, but I would urge us not necessarily to look at it that way. Both could be possible. 
Um, and just to give an example on each front, so with regard to increasing worker leverage, I don't want to be understood as arguing for returning to unions. As close to my heart as that uh, notion might be, I think it's um, impossible and fruitless. And uh, my friends in the labor movement are not happy with me, I'm sure, for saying this, but it seems to me that there are many forms of worker activism out there right now, uh, group formations that we should be supporting. I'm thinking here of the fast food forward movement, uh, which involves not only fast food workers, but retail workers and is now global. Um, enterprises like Occupy certainly had a, a bit of this flavor. Unions have supported both of these kinds of movements, so I don't mean to, to undermine the, their importance here. But these are the new way in which workers are coming together. Um, alternatively, workers coming together in a legal context to, per, to press for rights uh, in class action contexts like the Walmart case involving sex discrimination. The problem with these cases, though, is the, win the wins are not sustainable, usually. There's no institutional structure like a collective bargaining mechanism and an ongoing relationship that keeps that going. So you win, but then it, there's retrenchment that happens automatically. What entity will fight for that? I don't have a clear answer to that question, but I think we need to open the law to create some breathing space to protect those entities as they try to form. Um, and, and then to give an example of redistributing wealth uh, outside the employment relationship, if you're, if you're thinking about this at all, my students always respond to this one. The sub-minimum wage for tipped workers means that whenever you leave a tip, you are subsidizing directly the w low wages that the employer is paying. So just to bring it down to the, you know, kind of grassroots everyday lived experience level. I'll stop. Yeah, let, let's push a little bit more in, in this direction. I mean, government obviously does more than just uh, redistribute uh, or set the terms for, for bargaining. Um, you know, it defines the, the space. It regulates um, the space. That's been, I think, some of the story of the last uh, number of years. And, and uh, it can set, you know, wage standards as well. And that's one of the contemporary debates. Um, Michael, you didn't kind of go into that as much in your remarks, but, but, you know, how do you see the minimum wage you know, more explicitly fitting into that, and, and what are the trade-offs with some of the other um, approaches? Well, the Swedish Social Democrats in the 1950s and 60s. That, that's uh, how you begin all your answers, Michael. <laughs> had had a, uh, a very useful strategy, which I think it, it, we could all share, even in the 21st century, quite different so uh, societies. You have the traded sector, which is exposed to international competition and you have the non-traded domestic service sector. So you have, let's say, the steel workers who, who today are exposed to all kinds of competition. And then you have the janitors, you know, who are, are not exposed to, you know, foreign uh, competition in any way. And, you know, I, I think the beginning of wisdom is to recognize that these different sectors might actually require different regimes and even different labor regimes. So, for example, the argument in favor of a minimum wage in the non-traded domestic sector, it's very powerful. Uh, you're not going to impair American competitiveness if you pay, you know, janitors and baristas $15 an hour. Now, you might promote labor-saving technology at Starbucks or McDonald's, or which wouldn't be a bad thing in terms of productivity economy, but the, the, our international competitive is not going to collapse. On the other hand, it is the case, in a, unless you're going to adopt protectionism, that uh, wages are a factor in, let's say, automobiles and steel and so on. Uh, so, you know, there, there might be a case for, let's say, wage subsidies in the traded sector and wage regulations in the non-traded sector. And just one more th uh, 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 piece on, on the sectoral thing. Most of the gains of productivity growth accrue to uh, increasing returns industries in the traded sector, you know, automobiles, aerospace, it'll, next it'll be robotics and so on. So let's assume we have this great uh, return to unions, e even beyond what, what Marion is talking about. Uh, the unions, you know, in uh, uh, Boeing, you know, and, and Apple and so on, are going to be able to reap enormous increases just because of the huge profits, you know, in, in that sector. The nursing home sector, 
which is, tends to be a fairly low profit, highly divided, highly competitive sector in the United States, there just aren't enormously high profits to share, even if you, all the nursing homes are unionized. And I think that just strengthens the case for a kind of redistribution. It's not so much from class to class as from sector to sector. Uh, so you want to be able to redistribute from these high-tech sectors where you're getting these enormous windfall profits gains to the low productivity sectors where, because they're labor intensive, that's where you know, most people are going to work in the yeah. low, fairly uh, labor intensive domestic service sector. Heather, how have you weighed in on some of the minimum wage debates? Um, well, I think the minimum wage is important, um, but I wanted to uh, just one thing about this, though. I mean, I think that, I mean, the, I mean, a couple of comments. You know, first of all, the, the minimum wage affects uh, a small number of workers at the bottom end of the labor market. So it's certainly not the only labor market policy that we want to focus on. It's certainly an important floor. Um, we're seeing really exciting developments. Seattle just passed a $15 minimum wage, and I'm very curious to see the research on what that does um, to that local economy and whether or not it's um, it's good or bad and, and how that plays out. I think, though, um, I mean, one thing that, that, that Michael just said that I, I, I do have to comment on, though, is that you know, it, this is uh, something, at least in the U.S. context, the minimum wage is a policy that, again, it's it's targeted at lower wage workers. It's not um, the kind of policy that's going to affect workers in the kinds of, um, in some of the industries that you mentioned. But it's also um, the case that, that many of our trade policies have explicitly put U.S. workers in direct competition with workers um, in other countries in ways that have made it, um, that have exacerbated the consequences of globalization uh, in the tradable sectors that they haven't in the non-tradables. And I think that there are other ways to get at that issue rather than just saying, well, we can't do anything um, in terms of improving living standards for those workers. We could, for example, think about the way that we are focusing our, our trade policy or I think actually more importantly focusing um, on having a more competitive U.S. dollar, which would do away with some of those challenges. So I think that there's ways that you, um, we need to connect the dots and not, not just always be thinking that the problem lies in the, the wage subsidy, but that where is it that we are um, creating policies that are either um, uh, that allow for rent seeking or that allow that are focused at the top that actually have these very important consequences for workers down the income distribution thank you um, so we can open it up to the to the floor here I'd love to see some hands of um, have some questions to, for the uh, the panelists um, so just flag me down uh, don't be shy um, uh, I wanted to actually even explore this this concept as M Michael talked about his, his his some of his earliest research in this this civilian conservation corps and every time I go for a walk and see a great trail or come on a building that was built well built in the 1930s and has some actually design features to it it's an interesting place I often think you know why hasn't haven't we uh, embraced this this again uh, when our roads are falling apart or you know, we can be creating infrastructure. Um, you know, maybe for uh, each of you, um, is this uh, is this time for a new 21st century CCC? Um, is that too big of a hurdle to for us uh, in uh, the political scene to, to overcome? But but what would be the the, the argument um, for it, and, and where is its p potential? I think um, I think it could be part of the mix of, of responses. Um, we did the CCC was the the first. Uh, and really iconic example of, of service or what we now call service uh, what um, and general category of serving the country but not in military service but in some kind of uh, civilian service um, and I think that eventually led to the creation of AmeriCorps as as you all know which uh, was enacted in, in 1993 so AmeriCorps really is the the modern CCC it's a very much smaller uh, it's very much more decentralized, not controlled by the federal government. Um, I, think, I think that structure of AmeriCorps could be used to, to significantly expand the service, uh, uh, service idea so that uh, young people or actually people of, of any age, this idea could also 
certainly apply and does apply to, to some older adults, but it could apply at any age, that some service to the country is a, a good thing uh, and that there is work to do, as Reed said. There's, there's plenty of relatively low-skill work that would be beneficial to the nation in, in uh, energy use and conservation uh, and also, in, as, as uh, Michael Lind has pointed out many times, in infrastructure. A lot of those are more skilled jobs, but they're not all uh, more skilled jobs. So there, there, there's, there's productive work that can be done. Uh, you, we could have a vision much like uh, Franklin Roosevelt's that we will put together these, uh, these unused uh, resources uh, of uh, human resources with real needs of the nation and, and expand. And I would, you know, the easiest thing to do would be just to expand AmeriCorps. Uh, in some version, and there, there is, in very partisan times, there still is reasonable bipartisan support for, for AmeriCorps. Well, what's the size of AmeriCorps now? Does anyone know budget-wise or who it's employing? And that it got massive. I mean, it, the AmeriCorps uh, did get massive budget cuts over the yeah. course of the past few years, and many of the offices are basically shuttered at this point. I mean, where they're just they're not actually doing anything or having any projects go out because yeah. of the austerity that we're living in. So, I mean, CAT, the Center for American Progress, we had been advocating um, very loudly for expanding not only AmeriCorps but other forms of national service and um, the Congress over the past two Congresses has been uh, pretty dead set against anything that would actually have expanded funding for that. One thing I will add, though, that we did do um, sort of in the same lines, not so much, not so visible as the CCC, but um, you know, one of the one of the objectives of the administration when they came in in 2009. Um, dealing uh, one way to deal with the crisis was the uh, was to make investments in green technologies, and that's a lot of stuff that we don't actually see. Um, I I you know even sort of living here in Washington and working on these issues, I was very sort of struck by I think his name is Michael Grunewald. I was going to say Michael's uh, Michael's book, book on the New New Deal. Yeah, very. If you haven't taken yeah. a look at it, it's very important because it it gets at all of the hidden ways that those investments in um, you know that you sort of saw the money going out at the beginning, but then he goes as a journalist goes through and documents all the different ways that these are actually very profound and important investments that are yeah. that you know are boosting the US economy but not in the ways that lead to the beautiful buildings that right. you know you would right. notice yeah I think you have to distinguish between whether you're talking about the employer of last resort uh, being a counter cyclical thing used in recessions where you expand and contract uh, or as, as a permanent enlargement of the public sector workforce. And it's just, I, I think we've, we've learned from the CCC, from the Job Corps and the Johnson years, you know, from AmeriCorps, they're, they're real obstacles to the US government of all governments being able to expand public employment and then to shrink it exactly when, you know, the Council of Economic Advisors says the recession is over. Are you actually gonna be firing these people, particularly young people that you've hired during the expansion? There is a case to be made, it's quite avant-garde, for a permanent expansion of relatively low and middle-skilled public sector employment, which is mostly at the city and county and state level. Uh, you could, sh you know, triple the number of public school teachers uh, and have classes that were on average of 10 students instead of uh, 30. Would you do federal revenue sharing to fund some of that? Something we have proposed here in the past at, at the New America Foundation. Uh, and one of the advantages of this is if unions are, are pretty much decimated, one of the great things unions did in the 50s and 60s was they set standards for the other employers uh, because you could quit your crummy job and go work in the you know, steel industry or something. And so you had pattern bargaining where even non-unionized sectors tended to, to follow those standards. This is completely horrifying, you know, after 20 years of neoliberal Democrats and conservative Republicans. It may very well be that in the 21st century, as in the 19th, the government jobs are the best jobs, you know. Uh, in rural America, historically, and to this day, you know, if you can work for the county, that's, that's a better job, you know, than, than being a hired hand, you know, or, or something like that. So, as I say, this is quite a radical idea. Uh, but uh, uh, something we may have to think about. Yeah. All right. If I could just yes, follow. Please. If I could just follow on. I mean, you know, we live in this period where where the state is 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 talked about with derision. Uh, but you know, the role of the role of the state in in uh, in, in long term economic development has you know over time become stronger. So it's not it's not by any by any historical assessment. It's not it's not really there's not a reasonable case 
to be made for shrinking the state, leading to you know stronger economies going forward, although some people have this ideology, really groundless in terms of how economies actually work. So the idea, I, I very much, uh, I don't know if it's avant-garde or not, but I very much endorse the idea of not using language like jobs of last resort, you know, just for practical reasons, but I don't consider, I wouldn't consider them jobs as last resort. I think, you know, there's real work to be done. In some cases, markets don't, aren't able to, uh, to create that that work and the public it's, it's a legitimate role of the public sector to do that we do it we do it in uh, to create militaries and to create other pu public jobs that people think are very good jobs civil civil the entire civil service a lot of people in Washington have public jobs and they they do very well so I don't I don't think we should view it as a second-rate jobs but rather another source of, of employment doing work that that has to be done or could be done and benefit everyone thank you Okay, let's take a few questions here. Hey, there's a mic coming right to your hand. There you go. So there's certainly <coughs> the economic fr fragility of, of, of the family where there's, there's debt on, on, on one hand and there's the possibility of, of, of losing a job or something else. Or, uh, and related to that is, I guess, is the l leverage that a worker has and uh, in, in good times, the leverage a worker has is that they can quit and move on to another job, and the result of that is that employers uh, try to treat them better or and even pamper them, and we're in sort of the the opposite uh, situation. I would call it the current mini depression for yeah. the 99 percent. I think using the word recession is too. Uh, is, well, that's fine for the 1% since the stock market is higher than it was before. But I, I, I have a friend with a, a master's degree who, who, has, who, who works for the, the state of Maryland. And about a year ago, her, her bosses told her crew that they're going to treat them more shabbily because they realized that, that nobody could leave. Yeah. And yeah, this uh, related to a point I was thinking for, for Marion as well, that in the, uh, you know, how can bargaining work when we have such a, a weak, uh, you know, labor force, when, when there have these conditions where people can be undercut, where wages are stagnant and low? You know, what are some of the trade-offs there? Well, I mean, you make an excellent point. Um, there, this shows, again, the link between the larger economics of the situation, the larger economic policies and, and the state of the country and the the day-to-day -day life of American workers and the fragility of the American family. So linking, responding to Reed's question, um, again, this is looking back in history, but after all, the labor laws as well as the minimum wage laws, which we've been talking about, and Social Security and other provisions were enacted in the wake of the Great Depression when we were still struggling with a situation much like what we face now. That is, more, job, more workers than there are available jobs. And the way in which workers resisted that, the, the uh, kinds of statements this employer made to your friend, uh, sir, was to stand together. And when they had protection for the right to strike, picket, and boycott, they could actually bring that leverage to bear on the employer if they could persuade workers to join together in solidarity. And people were sufficiently desperate, I think, with their backs against the walls, that they were willing to do it. I'm not sure those same conditions and the same ethos prevail today. In fact, I don't think so. Um, that's why I don't think tr unions, per se, as they've originally been conceived, will work. Enjoyed your, your discussion earlier. So, w w what's happened is, is that private employment is roughly back to where it was uh, be, um, before this mini depression, but not not public em employment. And certainly, and what's happening in um, in my state of Maryland is that uh, there's no effort to bring state employment back to the levels yeah. of. Uh, of, uh, of, of six years ago. Uh, the, the mo when money's become available, they're, they're, they're figuring out how, how, how can we pass this on to the millionaires. Yeah, thank you. Let's have a question right behind. Um, Clay Ramsey, uh, Program for Public Consultation, University of Maryland, and this is to Marion. Um, I was intrigued by your discussing in passing the idea of replacing the Wagner Act with something contemporary, and it sounds like an idea that um, 
perhaps is spelled out at some length in the book. Is mm -hmm. that the case? And a couple of subsequent articles, yes. Oh, excellent. Mm -hmm. And maybe you could summarize uh, the nature of the replacement. Mm -hmm. That is, in particular, what rights would be buttressed, because I gather it would be a rights-based substitute, mm -hmm. um, and how they would be buttressed, how that would happen. Thanks. Right. Uh, so I would model, we would model this statute on Section 7 of the NLRA, which is the core provision of the Wagner Act protecting the right to organize and the right to engage in concerted action for mutual aid or benefit, which would include pickets, boycotts, strikes, and get rid of the rest of the um, baggage associated with the act. So no elections, no bargaining obligation, just essentially warfare in the streets. Um, and in the courts, right? Because workers would use the other employment statutes that have grown up since then to bring collective actions uh, or arbitration provisions their employers have required them to sign as a provision, a condition of employment to bring class arbitration uh, actions against the employer on the basis of wage and hour laws and the like. So those would be additional sources of leverage besides just striking and picketing, et cetera. In addition, um, we would include a remedial provision that tracks the remedial provisions in, say, the anti-discrimination laws. So capped damages according to the size of the employer would be available instead of the current situation under the labor laws, which is no damages available. The worst thing that happens to an employer who refuses to bargain is in order to go back to the bargaining table and do it again. And you can imagine that's routinely violated. Every once in a while, in an extreme case, there's uh, an obligation to repay additional bargaining costs incurred by the union as a result of that violation. It's just not enough to make anyone change their behavior, particularly when the advantages of being union free are so significant financially. So we need some uh, remedial provisions that track those of, of uh, other statutes. And looking to the anti-discrimination laws, they've made a huge difference. Right? We may not be done with the work that needs to happen in the anti-discrimination realm, I think we're far from it, but we've made significant progress. It's no longer politically correct to say, for example, I want to be minority free or woman free, yet it's perfectly fine to say I want to be union free. So we have a big um, you know, dichotomy here between the two statutes, and that's part of the reason money talks. Those damage awards are pretty significant. The other uh, thing we would add is a right to proceed on these claims in federal or state court so that we wouldn't have the mechanism of a National Labor Relations Board appointed by the president and therefore swinging back and forth uh, from right to left with each presidential administration. That's the current state of affairs and unfortunately what it means is that NLRB precedent is uh, unstable. So not, no gains that are won under the statute in that administrative realm are really, they don't, they're not sustainable. Um, Michael Sheradden, um, in other, other contexts we hear you talk about the role that savings and assets play along with income. And we do know that one of the ways that people deal with the fragile economy and, and, and uncertainty is that they're able to draw on some other resources they have. And if you don't have those, you're really uh, at a big disadvantage. Um, how are you seeing this kind of relationship play out between income and assets uh, in the contemporary well, scene? Well, I think, I think there is, a, there is a, a direct link to part of this discussion. Um, as, as Michael Lynn pointed out, uh, since the, especially since the 1970s, there's been an increasing emphasis on redistribution outside the employment uh, setting directly uh, through uh, retirement plans to, that are supporting workers. And it's increasingly the case that more and more returns uh, from, the, from the global product are going to labor and, uh, and, 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 or to capital and, and uh, gradually less to labor. I think uh, 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 Piketty's book is likely to be uh, supported in, on this count despite the discussions in the last week. Um, so, so I think we're living in a world where labor in general is going to be drawing less of the product and, uh, and, and, and within the incomes of labor that the, the distributions have become more unequal. So, so labor at the bottom is, is going to be very challenged uh, and I think we're going to be very challenged to think about policy strategies that depend only on uh, labor or supporting uh, labor incomes that are too low. I think that will be a, a, an ongoing catch-up game uh, going forward. It doesn't look, you know, 
it doesn't look really hopeful. So I think I think we we need to rethink actually uh, about what it takes to make a stable household and. Uh, I think the idea of labor income is an industrial era idea that is uh, that that that's what that's how people have sustained themselves. The social policy structures we have put in place really supplement that idea, and uh, gradually I think we're going to have to broaden that discussion so that social policies begin to support households in ways other than income support. And and I think we could start with uh, the enormously regressive public subsidies for building assets in retirement accounts, uh, which are now, uh, and also in, in home, in um, building equity in homes, both of these are, 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 are huge subsidies. So hundreds of billions of dollars there going mostly to the top. It was each year. A, each year. I mean, there would be a, a in my view, a, a, a quite reasonable. In DC, we often talk over 10 years. When you get a big number, it's like, <laughs> yeah. oh, it's a 10 year number. But right. no, these subsidies, these tax expenditures are, 250 if you home ownership and retirement each year. Trillion, right. Five years, trillion dollars. Okay, trillion, right. So every year, and uh, if you just thought in terms of, well, could this go, could this go equally to each household in America, which is, yeah. which is something I would call fair, uh, since it's a public provision, um, I would rather it was progressive, but I would take fair. Uh, then, then I think we we, yeah. we take an important step towards stabilizing a lot of households yeah. ju- through this one mechanism alone. So, so I think we should think beyond labor income. We do we do this asset building uh, subsidy. Enorm- it's the most regressive part of anything that's been discussed here today. Uh, it should it's it's a it's a it's a kind of scandal. Uh, yeah. But we don't talk about it that way, and we should. Um, Heather, I want to take the opportunity of having you here to connect this to some of the current inequality debates. Um, Michael mentioned uh, the Piketty book, which yes. obviously is getting a lot of attention. You know, one of the contributions I think that's valuable is that it's shedding a light on, on wealth inequality as in addition to income, which is kind of a new dimension, but something that we've been focusing on for a number of years. He's focusing mostly on you know, this divergence at the very, very top. Um, and we've seen the importance of helping you know, people with kind of at the middle and bottom end build up their, their, uh, their asset base. Um, you know, how do you see this current debate unfolding? Uh, I think uh, you know, I've often said in kind of current discussions that the Republicans don't want to talk about inequality. They'll easily talk about mobility. It's like, okay, well, let's talk about mobility then. What do you, what do you got? So, uh, but anyway, it's not going away. You're involved in this on a daily basis. How, how do you see it playing out? Yeah, so we, are, we have been involved in this on a daily basis. We had an event with, um, with Tomas uh, some weeks ago and um, have been digging into the, the hoopla around the, the Financial Times uh, said that there were some errors in the data um, and actually compared the error, the, the magnitude of the problem to the Rogoff and Reinhardt errors. Um, and I would just like to say here in public that that is just could not be further from the truth, um, was a bit of a stretch. Um, Rogart and Reifenhoff made you know serious errors that had serious policy implications that led to millions of people not being employed. Um, Thomas Piketty made a few uh, uh, typos, which always happens. Um, and one of my colleagues at uh, at the at the Center for Equitable Growth actually found that the one of the one of the things that the journalist pointed to that he thought that Piketty did wrong, that he did right, he actually did wrong as well. So there's just a lot of confusion out there. But all of this is a long way of saying I, I want to make three comments about this. I mean, first of all, it is just enormously important that we are finally, finally starting to have a fact-based discussion around what inequality is and what it means. Um, I think that's that's enormously um, exciting, and I think there's a lot of potential for new work to sort of just keep having this to keep having this conversation to see uh, to learn more about what this means and how it's impacting our economy, rather than just an ideological one. Um, second, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's been it's been exciting too to see folks on the right, um, some of whom have said that Piketty actually wasn't bad and that his data is good, and some of whom have been talking about economic mobility and equality over the past uh, few months. And I think the thing that, that Thomas's work really asks us to think about is how ri- today's rising inequality, this, this inequality in the flow of income to people, actually calcifies into, into tomorrow's um, increased inequality in the stock of wealth. And of course, it's such an obvious sentiment. We all know that. We're like, yeah, of course, we knew that. But we don't actually talk about that, right? That's not been a debate that we've had here in Washington in terms of just directly connecting those two facts and then what that means, what an increasingly calcified stock
block of wealth into the hands of a small smaller number of, of uh, individuals or corporations or families actually means for our economy. So I think that is very exciting to just start having that conversation and pushing it. And the third thing I will note about his work that I think is very interesting is that um, uh, he he calls for a number of policy recommendations that may that he himself calls utopian. But the thing that he keeps coming back to that I think is really interesting uh, for us here in Washington to start thinking about is, you know, we know a lot about incomes because we have government entities that gather data on them. It's a small thing, but it, it kind of makes all the difference. Yes. We don't know anything about wealth because yes. it's really difficult to track. Yes. I mean, if you just start thinking about it, it's like you got a house. Well, everybody, we can all go home and Google each other and figure out like what the value of each other's homes are. That's easy because that's all online, at least for the District of Columbia and other places, right? But but your, your other assets, financial assets and assets that are overseas, we don't know anything. And so Thomas relies on, you know, the Fortune 500 listings in the Forbes magazine. I mean, that's... As a, as, an, as an economist, that's ridiculous. So he calls for greater transparency in wealth. I, that would be... Yeah, and I don't think it's just yeah. transparency. It's just data sources, yeah. too, and it matters up and down the income scale, and so we should be tracking it on, yeah. a, on a regular basis. That's something uh, we can do. Expanding some of our data sets that the Federal Reserve uh, might collect every three years or so. Okay, well, thank you for uh, your time, everyone. Um, I, I appreciate it. We're going to bring this to a, a close, but... Um, uh, great discussion and, and wonderful contribution uh, with, the, with the volume. So um, thanks for being here. Thank you. Could, could I just say yeah. thank, thanks yeah. to New America Foundation for, for supporting this? Uh, our pleasure. Thank you. Our pleasure.